Well, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the desert. Yeah, good morning. All right. So we got a whole bunch of songs uh, lined up here, so we're just going to jump right into it. Um, I had what I felt like was a nice welcome earlier. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I said, you know, we were much like David, who uh, the first song we're going to sing is called As the Deer, and it's based on Psalm 42, and then I corrected myself, it's not David, it's the sons of Korah, but as they wrote this psalm, you know, it made me think like, hey, we're in the desert, much like the psalmist may have been at the time, and they get their keyboard out, and they sit down and have a little worship service, and say, we're not sponsored by Yamaha, but we use a lot of Yamaha keyboards here, and I said, uh, actually, archaeologically, they figured out that that is a lineage that goes way back because uh, David played a Yamaha harp. So, hey. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, go ahead, Brian. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, my. Well, you guys may as well just give in to it because you got it coming from the front, coming from behind. It's, there's, no, there's no escaping at this point. Um, Okay, we'll get our, get our serious faces on here. So I did want to share with you Psalm 42, um, and it's the inspiration for this song. And, uh, you know, when you hear, wow, you know, the psalmist wrote, my soul, it, it pants for the Lord, like, like a deer is thirsty for water. And you're like, man, that's beautiful. But then when you read the psalm, a lot of these beautiful things come from some pretty tough places. And I just thought about, you know, our walk with the Lord I want it so badly to be, you know, he talks about going from glory to glory, and I want it to be so badly like, hey, man, you know what? Every day has been better than the day before. But <laughs> how do we often experience life? It's not like that. It's a zigzag, isn't it? You know, you have a good day, and then maybe there's a bad day, and, and I think this psalm can be a real comfort for us. It's Psalm 42. As we follow Jesus and we see our, our good days followed by our bad days followed by more good days, and he says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You know, as we sing these songs, a lot of classics, very familiar ones, and, you know, I just, I want us to, Put his beauty before us. You know, if, if we're hungry for him, if we're thirsty for him, that's awesome. If not, you know, taste and see that he is good and that, that he will stir up that hunger in us. So will you stand up with us as we get ready to sing? Father, we just thank you so much for this morning together. God, I thank you that, um, Lord, you are so faithful that even in the midst of a struggle, I can say to myself, so why are you downcast? Why are you disturbed? Don't you remember who God is? Don't you remember what Jesus has done for you? And Lord, I just I pray for us this morning as we sing these familiar songs. God, will you cast them in a new light? Lord, will you, um, God, will you energize what we're doing in here by the power of your Spirit that, that beyond the notes played and the, and the melodies that we sing, that you are lifted up and glorified in a way that we cannot deny. We just pray it in your name. Amen. And as 
the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship thee you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship thee you're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king love you more than any other so much more than anything you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee and I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee and I long and I long to worship thee
and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus father god we thank you this morning that on the lips of everyone in here is invited to confess and praise the name of jesus the sweetest name the most beautiful name the most wonderful name the most powerful name the name of jesus god we gather here because of him your son And He has done all that is necessary for us to even have communion now with You, our Father, to be Your children, to be adopted as sons and daughters for the rest of our lives in eternity, that we belong to You, all because of what Jesus has done. And Holy Spirit, we thank You that because of that, because of Jesus' uh, redemptive work on the cross, that You then take that eternal gift and apply it to our lives by faith. That we will no longer fear of anything because Jesus is with us. He abides in us, and we in Him. God, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for all of what this day represents, the gathered body of Christ here at Faith Christian Fellowship and, and beyond these walls as well. We pray for all of Your children having gathered or are gathering now. We pray this in His name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. God bless you for participating. Thank you, Tony and Mac and Andrea, for leading us today. Well, nothing happened this week, did it? This is a totally boring week. There's nothing to talk about. Just all need to go home. Um, Actually, there's a lot that has happened. A few things that I'm going to get to in a couple minutes. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Gordon McDaniel. I serve as a lead pastor here at Faith Christian Fellowship, and so I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus, as has already been done by Tony and our team. I add my greeting to theirs. If you are visiting with us, we'd love to know that you are here by way of some kind of note. We provide them uh, our guest visitation cards out on the uh, out in the front foyer, or just come up and visit with me if you would afterwards, and and we can get to know each other, and I can hopefully try and provide for you any next steps of connecting here or being a part of this fellowship if that's what you desire. Um, If you are a guest in some other way, we're glad you are here. And obviously for our family, we're glad that we are together. Um, uh, Yesterday was a big day because our student ministry, 16 young people and five adults, returned safely from their mission trip. So how about a big round of applause for that? Praise the Lord. Uh, Maybe you will hear more about that in... In the near future, we're going to talk about our student trip and, um, and the joy of having them back with us, but really the joy of knowing what they were able to do while on mission this past week. Uh, it was hot. It was a long way from here. It was good work. But as I'll talk about in a little while, the community is what we more than anything else celebrate that they have enjoyed over this last, these last seven days. So thank God for him bringing them home to us and and we are together again as families, but we celebrate what happened there. The other thing that I cannot probably move forward without at least acknowledging is what occurred on Friday morning. Uh, and I want to give just a couple of minutes, not a long, maybe I'll provide a longer statement of this in the coming weeks uh, very soon, but I, I just want to acknowledge it. So most of you know that on Friday morning, the Supreme Court returned a ruling Uh, that basically abolished Roe versus Wade. Uh, And we are, as people of life, we celebrate this without a doubt. Um, Beyond talking about it, I typically try to uh, minimize my opinions, my thoughts about uh, cultural, political things, because I know that they can be divisive. Uh, This one is maybe less so, uh, than others, but nonetheless, I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time here to talk about it, except A, to celebrate the decision. I think it was the right decision. I'm sure many of you do. Obviously, by your response, you do. I believe it was the right decision. I believe the wrong decision was almost 50 years ago, and for the last five decades, men and women, some of you included, have 
gone about trying to see that it would, the decision of Roe v. Wade would be overturned. Here's some things that I want us to be aware of. Obviously, to be in prayer. One of the reasons I talk about it at all is we have a very strong partnership with uh, Lori Sines and the Hagerstown Area Pregnancy Clinic. Uh, this church has always celebrated life and has promoted the cause of life. And so we have been in strong partnership with Lori and her team at HAPC. We even have Diane Glaze, our own, Pastor Dave's wife, uh, is a Spanish translator for uh, crisis counseling at HAPC. So it is very much part of our experience as well. Uh, we have done many things to raise awareness and support for our local pregnancy clinic. We know that there is a, it already is happening and there is a chance even locally that we would experience a retribution for the decision that was made so we can be in prayer for our friends at HAPC, obviously for other partner churches like ourselves that we would uh, not experience violence. One of the things that I've said about um, the crisis pregnancy issue, the pro-life, pro-choice issue that it has uh, forged over the last 50 years, one of the things that I've said that I really was inspired when I met Lori Signs at HAPC, one of the things that she said is, uh, their goal, their commitment is to save three lives. Uh, obviously, there is the life of the child, the unborn child, and we celebrate that, that his or her life, there is a chance of protection. I, I do have to say, sort of as a tangent, I think all of us understand that uh, abortion was not legalized or, uh, or restricted in a sense of taking it out of Roe v. Wade. Now it goes to all individual states to make their policy on life. In Maryland, we probably won't see much of a change at all. Uh, and so the work continues to preserve life. But the fact that Roe v. Wade is no longer an obstacle to that is a small victory, a large victory, and we are thankful for it. Now, now the work becomes um, changing hearts and minds. But that's where I go to Lori. One of the things that Lori has said over the, uh, over the years that I've known her through HAPC is our goal is to save three lives to save one in the womb and two for eternity, all three for eternity, uh, for that mother, that father, and ultimately that child as he or she is born into this world would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So it is gospel motivated. Their life cause is gospel motivated, and we celebrate that with them. Uh, again, work to be done, but there is a step in the right direction, I believe, towards resolving this issue. Would you join me in a short word of prayer for the things that are going to happen and in response to Friday's events. Would you join me? Father God, we are lifting up our heart of praise and thanksgiving for um, a decision that was so wrongly applied 50 years ago that we now can see. I don't know if anyone, Lord, among us ever believed that in our lifetime we would see what happened Friday morning. And for that we give you thanks. We thank you that the tireless work that those who sought to preserve what I believe is the biblical mandate of life, that who sought to preserve it, many of those, maybe some have gone on, but there are many now who remain to see the result of what happened on Friday morning, and we give you thanks. It is to your glory that life is preserved. But Lord, we also know that there is a lot of work yet to be done. We know there is the chance of retribution and violence that is already being manifest. We pray against that locally as well as nationally. We pray that uh, life would prevail in that sense as well as in the womb. And, and so, Lord, we ask for your protection for those who have made it their effort, even peaceably. Lord, we do not condone violence ourselves, but those who have peaceably sought to preserve life, Lord, we pray that their lives would too be preserved. And Lord, as it continues to uh, lobby and move in the direction of life in every state, Lord, may we see a greater and greater victory uh, in the pro-life cause from state to state. Uh, we ask you that we ask that Maryland would uh, relent and see the value of life and preserve all three: child, mother, and father. And so, God, we pray over this. We give you thanks. We speak to it now in the name of Jesus, the life giver. Amen. Well, it is a busy week that we're going into. As you see behind me, as Tony already talked about, 
Uh, We are deep in the preparation and now on the threshold of Vacation Bible School. Please be in prayer. I just prayed for our uh, the decision of Roe v. Wade, but I also ask you to be in regular prayer this week if you're not directly involved of what is going to happen all this week from 6.30 to 8.30 every night, Monday through Friday of this week. It's decorated up. My thanks to Amelia and her team for what they've done thus far and what will be the remainder of these five days starting tomorrow. So please be in prayer. Come and see, come and observe, or come and serve and be a part of it. Uh, as this is one of our greatest outreaches to our community, as well as our own children that are part of this fellowship, a great opportunity to hear the gospel presented all through the week of VBS. So uh, thank you, Amelia and her team and all that is happening. I don't know that we'll keep our welcome desk right there in the front. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. Anyway, I liked it. Um, So that's that. Uh, Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We are beginning a new sermon series, The Joy of Fellowship, directly out of this marvelous, marvelous letter of Paul. Letter to the Philippians that he has written. God has inspired and he has penned. And I think of all of the themes, and there are maybe overlapping layers of themes that we could talk about. One of those is the pure joy of fellowship that this letter conveys just you cannot read this letter four chapters not a long letter you cannot read this letter and not walk away with a sense of affection for your brothers and sisters in christ that's the heart of what paul is conveying all through this letter it's one of the primary themes is the joy of fellowship and i think we'll see it no further than even today we will get into that but Before I do, when I think of the idea of fellowship, when I think of the idea of community, I want to give you some strange uh, but rather relevant examples of this in our world. I won't ask any of you if you've ever joined this particular group. It's kind of one of those things we don't talk about. But there is a group out there that we know of as Weight Watchers. I won't ask, and you don't have to tell. We'll just leave it rhetorical, right? Or not even a question, but rather the reality of Weight Watchers. There is a group, if you don't know this, and I'm sure very few of you don't, there is a group out there known as Weight Watchers that is built on the idea of community to help you maintain good weight. Wow. You not only are encouraged to be a part of it, and the accountability that comes from being a part of Weight Watchers, you, what else do you do? You pay to do this, right? You pay to be part of a group of people that are meant to help each other be accountable on the subject of weight. How about this? In the early 2000s, I think, about that time frame, late late 20th century, early 21st century, in the early 2000s, a place that you can spend literally 5 to $10 for a cup of coffee is selling not only coffee, but community. Where am I talking about? Starbucks, right? Starbucks. Buying a ridiculously costly cup of coffee And at the same time, and why I say in the early 2000s, this has always been their intent, but they literally had a community campaign with things written on their cups and creating these spaces where people would come and be community together. Let me give you one more. Beverly has been reading a book, not a faith-based book, but a book nonetheless on the subject of the empowered wife. And it's this idea of really challenging women to to live life not necessarily from a biblical perspective, although so many of the themes of it are biblical, whether they realize it or not, which is funny, as Beverly has been reading it, but to read this idea of what it means to be a wife, within that, you can pay to be part of a small... Ladies, you can pay to be part of a small group of women that will hold each other accountable to live and practice these principles of what it means to be a supportive and loving wife. You can pay to be a part of this, right? Now, 
I know that we take an offering, all right? But I think we have done a pretty good job of not trying to connect community with pay. But do you not notice one of those similarities in these examples? That's one particular similarity. All of these are paid. They are paid on the basis of a specific need, aren't they? Weight watching, drinking of coffee, for some of you is beyond sinful, all right? And thirdly, being a wife, ladies, being a wife that is supportive and loving of her husband. Let's pay to be a part of that community. Why on earth are you here today? No one asked for money. Uh, we, we invite you to give for kingdom purposes. There's no question about it. But you are not obligated to pay to sit where you sit. You're not, we didn't ask you to pay for the seats. If you are so inclined, that's great. We didn't ask you to pay for this good-looking person in front of you. If you're so inclined, that's fine. Right? All of these things are not obligated, and yet you have to ask the question, why are we here? Why are you here? What is, if if what we're seeing is a need that is translated into a cost that is paid for the benefit of receiving those needs met, seeing that those needs met, what is this that we are doing right here? Why do people have to go to Weight Watchers? or empowered wife conferences, or Starbucks. We serve really good Nicaraguan coffee right there in the kitchen. We charge for that, don't we? Uh, I'm sorry, okay, it's a little confusing. But I think very reasonable charge, right? Our kids just returned from a week of mission. Many of you gave towards that. They took time to raise money here and elsewhere to do that. There was an investment. There was a commitment. They gave up leisure time as much as the students did. Five adults gave up their leisure time to go and serve on mission. Pastor David and about ten others will will go to Costa Rica in just about two weeks from now to serve, be on mission as an extension of this church. And it costs greatly. Pastor Dave was telling me this week, and we're looking for cheaper ways to get there, believe me. But he was talking about trying to get to Nicaragua later this summer, not Costa Rica, but Nicaragua, that tickets were $4,900 with American Airlines to get to Nicaragua. Are there cheaper ways? We're looking into that. But to be on mission costs something, doesn't it? It costs us something. And you have to ask yourselves, with an Empowered Wife Conference, with a Weight Watchers program, with, a, with a, an entire industry of coffee, far too expensive, trying to create community, something that we are offered freely in the body of Christ. Why is it that we go those places and not here? or more resistant here than there. Not in Philippians, but in Colossians, I want you to hear the same author, Paul, say these words. First, in the first chapter of Colossians, verses 28 and 29, we proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. I want you to hold on to that word purpose. For this purpose I labor, Paul says. Maybe our key verses for this sermon series are found back in Philippians. Not our text for today, but out of chapter 2, we'll see in a few weeks, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, listen to Paul here. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, 
united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Purpose. The sermon series, The Joy of Fellowship, begins today with this sermon. One purpose, partnership of the Gospel. One purpose, partnership of the Gospel. If you've got your copy, I invite you to, and are able to, to stand with me in honor of the Word of God as I read it aloud. You silently as you follow along, whatever version you are using, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Remember the theme or the the title, One Purpose, the Partnership of the Gospel. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May God add His blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of His Word. You may be seated. We're just launching into this letter. We'll be in it through the the weeks of summer leading up to the fall. We will traffic through Philippians. We have to start with a little bit of background, what I would say are the beginnings. The beginnings of what really was this letter. You can turn there if you want. I've got a few of the key verses on screen if you'd like. But turning to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Paul is on his second missionary journey in this place of Acts. He is on his second missionary journey. He's gone once already with Barnabas. Barnabas and he have traveled through the area of Galatia, what is, our modern, what, what is the modern geography of Turkey. And they've gone through and they've planted churches the first time through. And they've seen both Jew and Gentile come to faith in the Lord Jesus. They've planted those churches. They've left them there. They've put leaders in place and they have left them there to grow and to thrive. They go back to Jerusalem. They make sure that they have the apostles, the original apostles, the twelve. They make sure they have their approval for what they are doing. They're explaining what they're seeing, Acts chapter 15. They're telling what's going on. They're asking for full approval and confirmation that we are doing what you want us to do, that the Lord Jesus would want us to do. Are we on the right track? And the apostles consider and give them their full blessing. Now, Barnabas and Paul then part ways, and so now Silas comes into the picture, and he and Paul now become the team, and they are now in their second second missionary journey, and they're going back, and they are revisiting some of those same churches that they were a part of from the beginning, their first journey. They're going back, and they're strengthening them, the the thought being that we're going to build them up even stronger and further, but something happens in Acts chapter 16. In verses 7, 8, 9, it says this, And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go uh, go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by uh, Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. 
Now, Macedonia, they had not been yet. Their first journey was not. And so they didn't even imagine themselves going to Macedonia. They thought of themselves staying in the regions that they have been. And the Spirit of Jesus prevented them. And then Paul was given a vision to go to Macedonia. Come to us and help us. What we learn is that the arrival in Philippi, which we'll see in just a moment, was Spirit-led. It was miraculous. It was a presentation. The Spirit of Christ kept them from going further, and a vision appeared to Paul from a man calling out, please come and help us. Every bit of this is God's divine work. Then we go on and we read just a little bit further. In chapter 16, verse 15, they have now arrived in Philippi, They're there and they are ministering. And notice what it says in verse 15. And it says, And when she, which is Lydia, and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She insisted and she convinced Paul and Silas and the others with them to remain and to fellowship together stay with us if we have proved faithful to you stay with us and be with us they did they agreed to do so and the next part of the story tells and many of you know this of the story the the story tells of the young girl that was caught up with a demon possessed by a demon uh, bothering paul and silas interrupting what they are trying to do and so they cast out the demon and her masters basically call the magistrates to have what would result in Paul and Silas being thrown into prison. You know the story, that they're in prison after, a, after some dialogue with the magistrates. They're now in prison. They're in stockades. They're in the deepest part of the dungeon. And in that place, Paul and Silas begin to sing and pray. And an earthquake comes upon the prison. And all of the doors are broken off. And they are free to leave in so much as the Philippian jailer wakes up the jailer who was told, watch over these men, do not lose track of them. That when he sees the open doors, he goes to kill himself. And he hears the voices of Paul and Silas call out, sir, do not kill yourself. We are here. What's the result of that? They share the good news of Jesus Christ with the jailer and he and his household come to faith. At the end of this chapter, verse 40, we read this. They they go through, the magistrates, they appeal to Rome, they appeal to their Roman citizenship. They are freed, but they are told, we are freeing you, but you have to leave us. Do not remain here in Philippi. Verse 40, the end of the chapter, we read these words. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and then departed. This is the backdrop of the Philippian church. Guess who were some of the pillar members? Lydia, her household, a jailer, and his household. This is the church in Philippi. Now, probably years later, do you know where Paul is writing his letter now? He was in prison in Philippi. Guess where he is? He's in prison in Rome. Dealing with that now, he is writing back to them and talking about what happened in the beginning. Do you remember it? Do you remember what happened? So turning back to Philippians chapter 1, we have him refer to the beginnings. Verse 3 of chapter 1 I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now from the first day until now you have not failed to participate to be a partner with me in the advancement of the gospel he's writing to Lydia He's writing to the unknown, we we don't know his name, only know him by his title, the Philippian jailer. 
They are the recipients of this letter years later. Imagine. Remember the beginning, guys? Remember what we were doing together? Every time I think of you, my heart is drawn to you. I have such fond affection for you. I, Lydia, I was in your house. We broke bread together and for the participation in the Gospel from the first day until now. And then verse 6, one of the most familiar verses of the entire letter. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. We often use this particular verse. We probably don't use it very accurately. It doesn't mean that God will not do the work in us if we're talking merely about our own personal gospel story. If we were talking about our own personal gospel story, I trusted Jesus Christ when I was eight years old. You all have your story of the gospel. And is Paul saying that God will complete that story, that he's going to complete that story in my life, that he's going to complete that story in your life? Is that what Paul is talking about? Though that may be true, that's not actually what Paul is talking about. Yes, we all have our own personal stories of the gospel, but he's talking about the fellowship of the participation in the gospel movement. And what he is saying to them is, what you started, what started with you, will be completed until the day of Christ Jesus. Turn over into Philippians chapter 4 to show you what I mean. Again, I think we'll have a couple verses on screen, but if you're following along in chapter 4 of Philippians, look down at verse 15. Nearing the end of his letter, Paul says this, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, not me, I'm gone, right? I'm already gone. When you first started preaching the gospel, after I left, right, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. Paul says, hey guys, you were unique. You were one of a kind that you gave and participated in the gospel movement in Macedonia. And then he goes on to say, verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, well, that's not Philippi. You see, in the storyline of the second missionary journey, Paul goes on. He leaves Philippi. He goes on. And one of the places that he visits after Philippi is Thessalonica. Listen to what he says. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek. But I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Now, if you've not been with us, I just finished, we just finished a sermon series on the subject of rewards. Here, you find the thread of connection between what we just talked about the last several weeks and what we're going to be talking about in the book of Philippians. Look at what he says, because of what you did, because of your participation in the gospel, financially, relationally, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, even without me, you went forward and kept doing. And when I went on to Thessalonica, what did you do? You sent money ahead of me. You sent money to me to meet my needs. And here's what I want to tell you. It's not for me, but for your account that I credit you. You sent money. You didn't, all, you didn't send money all the way to Thessalonica. You know where you sent it? You sent it into your account eternally. That's how far out you sent your gifts you will receive them back with interest, with reward, with blessing. You will receive it back. But you were unique that you invested in the gospel. You invested in me and you invested in the gospel and it will be credited to your account. That's what I think he is saying in Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you know that Philippians 1.6 has everything to do with June 26th, 2022? Do you see that the Philippian investment in Paul in Thessalonica to meet his needs is why we are here today? He has perfected it 
and he is continually perfecting it and will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. When Jesus returns and all believers of every tongue and every tribe and every nation confess his name, it will be because, in part, the Philippians sent money forward. They put money in action. They put investment in action. And where it matters that there is in, where your, it makes sense, right, why Jesus said the following words, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It makes total sense. You know, when you give in the area of financial, I'm, I, this isn't the only way, but this is certainly one of them. When you give, maybe some of you gave to the uh, mission trip that the kids just got back from. Maybe some of you were givers. I can promise you, and if you didn't give, this is not meant to be a condemnation by any stretch, but it's just a reality. For those that gave towards that, there was a special piece of them that went. Right? If you didn't, and again, no condemnation, maybe your heart is in other places, and that's great. But where your treasure is, there your heart is. I know that many of you who gave to the student trip or who sent kids, or who sent spouses, five of which did so, your heart was there. Your affection was there. It's not just, it doesn't, Kentucky was not just, for the last week, for our family, Kentucky was not just another state on the map. Kentucky had my two kids. Kentucky had a little bit of our financial investment. Kentucky had five adults who gave up leisure, friends of mine who went and dedicated themselves to something. And if my affection was anywhere, it was in Kentucky. Think of what the Philippians felt like as they gave, probably very sacrificially. The church in Philippi, like most churches in the early years, they were not wealthy people typically. To the extent that they did have wealth, they shared it. We learn of that from Acts chapter 5. Chapter 4 and chapter 5. Where there were wealthy, they gave it away. But many weren't, and yet you can see them giving because this is where their heart was. Where their money was, was where their heart was. It makes sense why he says, my affection for you could not be stronger. My joy, make my joy complete. That's the beginnings That's the participation. And now, from earth to heaven, verses 7 to 8 of chapter 1. And the peace of God. No, excuse me, that's chapter 4. Chapter 1, verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. There it is. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how long, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I love this from earth to heaven. To me, this sounds a lot like James chapter 2. James chapter 2 is a, is a difficult passage. We wonder, is James teaching a, a message of salvation by works? I don't think he's teaching that at all. But what he is telling us is that if you... If you have a, if, if you say, or, or 1 John we could go to as well, if you say you love God, it better show up in how you treat each other. You cannot say, I love God and despise my brother. That's 1 John. James chapter 4 is, what are we doing saying to those who have great earthly need that we encounter who, who, who are hungry and cold and without provision, that we say to them, brother, be warm and be filled? He says, will that faith save you? He's not questioning their salvation. He's saying your faith should and will manifest in your love for one another. Practically. A lot of times in churches, we get, we, we get too far on one end or the other. We are either all concerned about social action, or we are all concerned about what's going to happen in the future. I don't really care right now what's going on. I'm only thinking about eternity. Paul is saying neither is correct. He's talking about his imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This is a both and. 
You have ministered to me in my greatest need, and in doing so, you have helped advance the kingdom of God further. Do not get into this rut to think that a, that a church exists to be socially active or a church exists to be merely eternal. It is both. It requires both. It calls for both. We see each other's need and we engage with each other. We are in fellowship with each other. We share all things in possession. We share with one another. Because there are needs in the moment and there are needs towards eternity. They are both Part of the same message in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel don't get caught in one or the other rut live however uncomfortably or intention you must live between them recognize that there is work to be done on this earth because we are gospel motivated and there is a longing for what god will do because we are gospel motivated both exist at the same time. And lastly, if we go from the beginning and we go towards participation and we go then towards a sense of earth and heaven both, then we get to this astounding statement. Verse 9, Paul says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. You have got to be kidding me, Paul. You're telling us, and the letter will unpack this, all that the Philippians have done, you couldn't offer them a day off? You couldn't give them an opportunity for retirement? You couldn't have said, you know what, guys? You've done enough. Take your leisure. Relax. Put it on cruise control. I just drove this past week to see my folks for a couple of days See, my mom and dad, my dad's 85th birthday, my mom just having come through surgery uh, in recovery, she's doing great, my dad's celebrating his 85th birthday, I was able to take Isaiah and the two, while the kids were in Kentucky, I actually closed the gap on them a little bit, right? But that wasn't intentional. And I went across the, the mountains here in West Virginia, Maryland, up into Pennsylvania, and across all the way to the other side of Ohio. And there was a delightful thing, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it on your cars, called cruise control delightful rest the legs be comfortable right now on the mountains that's a little tougher but you get to ohio man and you can see you know you can see a truck coming from 10 miles away set cruise control and and be on it you would think that paul could offer them a moment of cruise control don't you of all of the things that he commends them for and this letter is full of commendation Of everything that you do that brings joy to my heart, Paul says, you have made my joy complete when I think of you. Wouldn't you imagine him being able to offer them some rest, some time off? What does he say? And this I pray, that you, that your love may abound still more and more in all knowledge, in real knowledge, excuse me, and all discernment. The Philippians, as marvelous, as marvelous as a a church as they were, had a long way to go. Their whole life. There was no retirement. There was no stopping. There was no having achieved in this life. The day of Christ Jesus, and that's what he says, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Our life on this earth is a drop in the bucket. We know that. We believe that in all eternity, 70, 80 years, whatever the Lord grants, each and every one of us, shorter, longer, whatever it is, it is called to be given from beginning to end, from the time of, that I am encounter the Lord Jesus in my life until I take my last breath, there is room for me to grow in my love, in my knowledge, in my discernment. I have not arrived. We look at a church that that almost more than any other that you will encounter in the history of the world seems like it has arrived. And yet Paul says, abound still more. There's more to be done. And you know what I have found? This is what I have found in people who love serving the Lord. 
Don't tell somebody who loves serving the Lord to take it easy. They are not interested in that message. If you want to tell me to take it easy, then everything that I have worked for up to this point is somehow reduced and diluted. Why would I want to stop? For what God has done, what, what, is, what is the finish line? The finish line is seeing Jesus. The finish line is knowing that Jesus says, well done. This is what I wanted you to do with your life. This is how I wanted you investment. Sometimes we get in the idea that we think that there's some sort of earthly finish line. Well, you know, pastors, Beverly and I have talked about, how long, how long will I do what I do? Why would I stop? <laughs> Seems fun, you know? I enjoy it. I enjoy being a part of other people's lives. Maybe it'll be vocational. Maybe it won't someday. Maybe some of you are truck drivers. You're teachers. There is no end. There's no finish line until one point in your life you meet Jesus. There's your finish line. And he's saying to one of the greatest churches that has ever been in the history of the church, he's saying to them, abound still more and more. You hear that? More and more. Keep going. And it's been my experience, as I've already said, that the people who really, believers who really understand this, they don't want to be told to stop. Why? Why? I'm loving it every bit of the way. God has given me such a picture of His grace. Why would I stop doing it? Maybe it's actually that those of us who are a little too a little too comfortable in our faith are the ones that are like, well, I've kind of reached that point of comfort and, and conclusion. Not if you're still here. Not what Paul would tell us. And all of this, all of this takes us back up. Verses 3 and 4, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always offering prayer, how? With joy in my every prayer for you all. They were of one purpose. You couldn't get them off track. You couldn't, it appears in in Paul's words, that you could not get the Philippians to get off the one track. They're not about to give it up. No way. We are not stopping what we are doing. We're going to keep going. We are going to keep pressing until we lay it at Jesus' feet. And then we'll rest. We'll take our rest when he tells us. One purpose, participation, partnership in the gospel. I so look forward to this series, the joy of fellowship. The joy of doing this together. We got got coffee companies. We got billion dollar coffee companies. I don't know. We've got a weight management group. We've got an empowered women's group. we got all kinds of things that tell us that you know how you get things done? Do it in community. And the church is sitting back there going, "Mm, never thought of that. (laughs) Wow. It's been made available. Jesus died for it. And He calls us to live in partnership with each other to accomplish the purpose. Let's pray. Father God, I'm so thankful that my kids and our kids and the leaders with them arrive safely home. But Lord, would we say that we are actually more excited for the community and the fellowship and the one purpose that they accomplished while they were gone. I would far more want them to have gone away and come home than I would have wanted them to stay all along. I would have deprived my kids. I would have deprived this church. I would have deprived your people from experiencing the joy of fellowship over one purpose. Being gospel-minded in our entire life. Bringing the good news of Jesus. Being the hands and feet of Jesus. Whether it's to serve, whether it's to proclaim, whether it is to comfort, whether it is to admonish, that we might grow up each other in the fullness of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what Philippians, this letter, and the people of Philippi, the church there, teaches, what it teaches us 
about being a New Testament church, to be a, a fully devoted church to the gospel. We love you and we thank you and we pray that you would instruct our hearts over these next several weeks with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Be praying. A big, big week for our church. Our biggest maybe outreach of the entire year. Be in prayer for that or in participation. Look forward to seeing you on Monday. God bless.